Aman Hawari will be speaking today on the capsule irradiation experiment um, that he's working on in conjunction with the MIT irradiation, and he's joining us from North Carolina State University. Welcome. We are collaborating on an IRP project, and our task within the project is to uh, consider establishing a molten salt irradiation facility uh, with uh, monitoring capabilities uh, under neutron uh, radiation and uh, uh, also temperature controlled. Uh, and this will be uh, set up in uh, our Pulsar reactor. Uh, also, uh, we are developing uh, using our uh, set of instruments at the reactor, uh, the capability of uh, pre and post radiation of samples that might be irradiated uh, in this uh, facility. University reactor history started here in 1949 with the building of the first reactor, which actually had a urinal sulfate uh, core, homogeneous core. Uh, and uh, it was the R1 reactor uh, and got the R1 license from uh, the NRC back in 1953. Uh, it went critical. Uh, and then we transitioned to the Pulsar reactor uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. So we've been operating the Pulsar for about uh, 50 years now. Uh, the Pulsar, uh, as it currently stands, is a one megawatt power reactor. It's an open pool in tank uh, facility. Uh, it's light water moderated and cooled. Uh, it's fueled with assemblies that have a UO2 fuel clad in zircaloy, uh, with the, each assembly having a, an array of pins in it, about 25 pins. Uh, and uh, we have mixed four and six percent enrichments in the core. Our core is highly under moderated, so our thermal fluxes actually uh, peak in the region around the core over here. Uh, and uh, this is where uh, we have used this type of uh, characteristic, uh, the fact that our thermal fluxes are available in close vicinity of the core to set up uh, a suite of instruments relevant to the discussion today, uh, where we're gonna use uh, some of these instruments like the powder diffractometer and the positron beam in order to examine irradiated materials. Uh, we are relying on our experience with the, the fission gas uh, release and measurement system that has been uh, set up uh, also in one of our beam tubes. Uh, and we're now setting up uh, the molten salt irradiation experiment, but this one will be uh, set up uh, in the pool of the reactor in close vicinity of the core uh, with the uh, instrumentation uh, set up in uh, this area uh, on top, on the, on the uh, uh, top of our pool. So oh, this really uh, shows uh, the layout of our reactor with the intended uh, radiation location uh, and the intended uh, location for the instrumentation for monitoring and control uh, of the radiation uh, experiment. And we expect that in our experiment we reach uh, in this uh, closer vicinity to the core, we will reach into the 20, uh, 10 to the 12th uh, neutron per centimeter square second uh, thermal fluxes and similar uh, fast fluxes uh, in these uh, in this location. In the design of the facility, uh, we're looking at the monitoring, uh, the production and monitoring of the release of the fission gases, uh, the uh, noble metal uh, materials, tritium, uh, and uh, also any other releases that might uh, be uh, developed during uh, the radiation process. Uh, we're going to uh, monitor the release and the transport uh, of these species uh, and uh, look at detection uh, using different methods. Uh, we're looking at gamma spectroscopy techniques, uh, which we've used for our other uh, fuel uh, monitoring experiment. We're looking also at the LIBS technique and of course tritium monitoring techniques. And then of course we have to collect and, uh, dis uh, and, and dispose uh, of the uh, result, uh, the uh, products of this experiment uh, through uh, some sort of uh, exhaust capabilities. So what drives our experiment uh, is the fact we are 
controlled by certain uh, detection requirements and safety uh, limits. So we're looking at the uh, signal to noise ratios uh, that we can achieve uh, with the, the irradiation experiment, looking at certain uh, salt uh, amounts. We're looking at uh, tens of grams, maybe into hundreds of grams of irradiated salt uh, in order to uh, achieve the detectability limits. And at the same time, we are restricted because we are irradiating in pool uh, by the fact that we cannot allow uh, the pool to boil. So our heating uh, elements cannot uh, uh, produce temperature on the outside of the heating tube or, or of the experimental tube uh, that would result uh, in boiling of water. This is a layout of what we envision uh, the in-pool facility lo to look like. This is the tube will be accessed from top of the pool uh, and uh, we have the uh, heating uh, furnace uh, and then inside there will be the uh, access to a salt uh, reservoir and then uh, we will be monitoring the salt uh, and what uh, is released from the salt uh, by sweep gas, helium sweep gas, that will then take us into detection locations, uh, could be LIBS, and that's what we're considering right now, and also gamma, gamma spectroscopy uh, detection uh, capability. And we think that uh, both could be uh, complementary in that we can combine data for both uh, in order for us to really achieve maximum benefit. The capability over here is, uh, like Charles showed, quite complex, but we're highly benefiting from our previous experience in the design of this facility, and we've actually built uh, this type of uh, fixture uh, for irradiating uh, microspheres of fuel uh, in our beam tubes, and now we're transitioning uh, to irradiating and uh, detecting the release uh, from salt using very similar concepts. So in order to allow us to design this facility correctly, we're combining both the Neutronics models uh, with the uh, uh, CFD and multi-physics models. Uh, and in this case, our neutronics models benefit from the fact uh, that we have developed uh, the modeling capability for molten salts in order to correctly uh, assess uh, the neutronic environment uh, in the salt uh, and uh, calculate uh, with this neutronic environment, uh, mainly the thermal spectra, uh, calculate uh, the production rates for different species. Uh, here I'm showing uh, uh, the data in particular for uh, the molten salt fly, which we've developed uh, and are using in our neutronic models. Then we combine this with, com with COMSOL models. Uh, these COMSOL models uh, take uh, the input from the neutronic models in terms of uh, the uh, produced uh, species concentrations uh, in the salt, in the environment uh, that is the, uh, dominated by our uh, core uh, and its radiation and uh, heating, uh, in addition to the heat that we provide, uh, the heaters that we provide, and it combines everything in order for us to get a good idea of uh, the release while we are designing uh, and setting up the uh, experimental uh, facility. So the modeling and simulation and the experimental work are going hand in hand. I show here a heat, uh, the, he uh, the heating uh, system calculations uh, with the furnace uh, heating the salt, and we are able to look at the temperature of the tube in this case, and ensure that the uh, tube does not reach, uh, reach a temperature that exceeds the or allows the boiling of the water uh, in the core uh, in order to meet our uh, technical specification limits uh, for the reactor. And at the same time, to know that we are reaching our uh, uh, radiation temperature objectives of uh, around the 700 uh, C uh, range. Uh, in our designs uh, for the uh, fueled experiment uh, or the fuel monitoring experiment, we actually designed up to 1000 C and we're looking at the variations in temperature here that we can achieve. And this uh, also, this model shows uh, how uh, xenon and krypton are produced actually in the salt reservoir and then their release into uh, the uh, sweep gas system uh, towards the detection uh, uh, 
detection instruments that we will uh, be using. So we're using all this right now in order for us uh, to try to ensure as much as possible uh, that we achieve the objectives that uh, we're aiming for. Uh, in addition, as I said, we are designing uh, the access uh, through the tube system from the top of the reactor for all the instrumentation, uh, sweep gas, uh, temperature monitoring uh, and flow monitoring devices, uh, all of that uh, based on the similar experience that uh, we've established previously. Uh, therefore, I expect that uh, uh, the uh, design uh, and setup process uh, to be moving uh, quite swiftly in this case. Here I show you the tube uh, that we have already set up uh, and that we are testing. Uh, in our pool uh, and uh, the uh, optimizing the location uh, for this tube and looking at the type of uh, neutron fluxes that we can uh, achieve. Uh, it actually is a good match to our expectations here in terms of measurements. Uh, the, it's a good match to the expectations of the simulations. So we're moving forward with that. Uh, this is a uh, view of the insert that's going to go into the tube with the uh, salt reservoir uh, that's going to be introduced and the uh, furnace facility that's currently uh, being finalized, uh, these designs. And this is a closer view uh, of the furnace and the insulation. Uh, as you could see here, uh, this uh, resembles closely what we have built before. And so we are adjusting uh, this design and what we previously built for the fuel monitoring facility uh, in order to fit uh, and meet the objectives of the current facility. And so we have the insulation, which is uh, alumina-based insulation, and these are the heating elements uh, that are molybdenum-based. And uh, be, as I mentioned previously, uh, we, ha we were designing and we were, we were achieving temperatures exceeding uh, 1,000 degrees C. We're also looking at the uh, LIBS uh, measurement uh, capability. Uh, we're hoping that uh, this uh, capability will be used uh, in order to uh, assess the elemental uh, content uh, in the uh, sweep gas uh, and uh, at particular locations, uh, especially if we collect uh, some of that sweep gas and uh, 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 on substrates that are placed uh, in the uh, flow uh, path. Uh, and uh, use the outcome of this elemental analysis in combination of uh, designed gamma spectroscopy devices or detectors, uh, which have also been uh, outfitted uh, with uh, the flow uh, path that ensures that we have a uh, reasonable detection efficiency uh, and that we're able to achieve the uh, detectability limits uh, that we have designed for. Uh, and so uh, these instruments are now uh, in the process of being set up. Uh, we are still uh, looking at the LIBS devices uh, and uh, looking at optimizing uh, that capability for the loop system. And of course, we are looking at tritium monitoring and considering several options for that. Uh, and so we are now finalizing uh, the uh, acquisition uh, of equipment, finalizing the choices, uh, and subsequently the acquisition of uh, all of these equipment uh, for our uh, designed experimental system. So going back to the capabilities, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to also uh, consider uh, the ability to irradiate in salt environment certain materials and then examine them uh, before and after irradiation uh, to see uh, any consequences of that. Uh, 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 and we are using the instrument systems uh, in our uh, reactor uh, area. Uh, one of these instruments, for example, is the positron measurement capabilities, which is uh, uh, really ideal for looking at thil thin films that might uh, form on irradiated samples and uh, examine the nature of these fil uh, thin films uh, in terms of their uh, also porosity. Uh, uh, structure. Uh, 
And so we've upgraded our uh, positron beam system uh, that shows here a beam coming out of uh, our reactor uh, vicinity, the vicinity of the core, and with samples, uh, radiated samples being placed here, and then signals uh, being collected uh, due to the an annihilation of the positrons from which we can uh, extract uh, information about uh, these films. Uh, and we can, of course, do the uh, experiments pre-irradiation and post-irradiation uh, to establish uh, the uh, comparison of the effect of irradiating in the salt environment. And so, in summary, design of our molten salt irradiation experiment is underway. Uh, along with that, the conclusions are being used for equipment acquisition and also to prepare for our pre and post uh, radiation possibilities uh, using uh, thin film analysis uh, with the positron annihilation system uh, and possibly the uh, neutron diffraction system. And with that, I conclude and thank you and welcome questions. Looking at your online monitoring, you, you might uh, listen in tomorrow morning at the 8.30 session, operations and monitoring, both Amanda Lyons and Hunter Andrews might have some technology you're interested in. So from the questions, um, will you be looking at release rates from both hot and cold salts for these isotopes or only operational behavior? We have temperature control, and so we will uh, definitely look at the hotter, uh, or we have the option of looking at the hotter and colder uh, conditions. So there is nothing that prevents us from uh, collecting whatever we can as a function of temperature. I'm going to open the floor if there's any questions for any of the four of our speakers today. Just oh. Charles Forsberg, let me just mention uh, one item for those who may or may not be following the activities. The uh, Chinese are likely to have a molten salt reactor up and running two megawatts in the next couple of months. And of course, Kairos plans to have a reactor up and operating in 2026, 35 megawatt reactor, 2026 in Oak Ridge. So the, uh, the industrial machines are coming in fast. <laughs> They're clear customers for whatever we can get together and uh, on the time scales required. Very much want to see what's uh, exactly in the off gas because that was something which looks different than what we were doing at MSRE because we they had kind of have an oil uh, foam on top of their uh, their system, uh, kind of filtering everything, uh, and it's much easier to go make measurements uh, in uh, in when you have a dedicated facility which is intended to do that. Uh, so we're uh, so the, uh, so several of these will be producing very interesting results uh in the next couple in the next couple of years and we are very and i'm looking forward to seeing uh, these results so how many uh, uh so we were getting uh an inl salt irradiation an mit salt irradiation another mit salt irradiation an ncsu salt irradiation we haven't had uh we've had uh, unfueled salt irradiations in the past 50 years but these uh the these the the fueled salt irradiations are about to come uh start coming in fast and heavy so we're we're very uh you know, we're really looking forward to this is sort of indicating that we are making the transition uh into again building on a solid foundation so also, David, to comment there, uh, you know, in Patricia's uh, discussion this morning, she mentioned other university studies that are happening, and, and one of those included a field salt irradiation as well. We're moving well, in the right I direction. Mean, the uh, Penn State is being paid uh, to develop a uh, field salt irradiation capability at the Breezeale reactor. Uh, I know that one's in uh, on P Patricia's thing, but I don't know anybody else who's really doing uh, a, a, a fueled salt irradiation at the moment. Uh, this would be new work, I'm pretty sure. So there are some additional questions in the chat. Joanna asks, what sort of sensitivity will be needed for off-gas analytical techniques for fission product xenon? So I guess maybe this is something that we're looking at in our facility. And for the fission product uh, xenon, if we look at, uh, because we are setting up the gamma spec system in uh, conditions that are 
operational for such a system, we feel like uh, tens of grams actually would allow us to uh, see the off gas released uh, or, or the uh, fission gas released uh, for this uh, with this particular capability uh, with the with the significant accuracy. So we don't need that much uh, because our environment, uh, the background environment is not too high. Therefore, the detectability is reasonable. Uh, and of course, we'll combine it with LIBS as much as needed. I've noticed a couple of uh, uh, experimental facilities that are being set up and experiments that will be run. And that's really nice. Um, I guess an encouragement I have coming from the mod and sim side is uh, uh one of the challenges I think all the modern sim folks face in this space is validation data. Uh, so, I, and, and your experiment seems particularly well instrumented. So, I guess my question is: uh, Is that something you guys are, are working on and consider collecting the information in a way that it could be used for model validation uh, purposes? Uh, from our point of view at NCSU, yes, that's built into our effort. Uh, because we recognize the fact that in modeling and simulation, you need fundamental data that uh, describes the release process. And so, so phenomena uh, control that. Uh, maybe, you know, there is diffusional effects and temperature-driven effects. So we hope that with the measurements that we conduct, we can achieve a good understanding of release to birth or really release to production ratios, which then can be used to uh, help uh, support the simulation efforts in terms of validation even. For a little bit of follow up on there, I noticed there are several discrete uh, different things. Do you have already contacts with you know, the, the developers of SAM and Mole and uh, the other uh, transforms sitting there, there uh, to, you know, how do we feed the data in, make sure that we've got the correct types of data and have you already started with the, because we're trying to make sure that there's a seamless transition and that we don't keep developing different sets of tools and that we make use of the tools and add the capabilities there so uh, they're, they're useful for people. So do you already have those contacts made and plans for how we're going to support things like the, the NEMS tool sets? I can't say that we've had, we've established direct contact, but we'd be interested. And so actually that feeds into um, the session we'll have. Ray, who would be the person to talk to you for that? Part of this is we're trying to uh, to describe the chemistry, the experimentation, the modeling and simulation, all of these things to support that central element of how do you build reactors that work and work safely and continue to work well for many years. And so we're, we're trying to paint a, a coherent picture. And the next step on this is the modeling and simulation part.